Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Village of Woodridge board meeting, and I would ask coordination to please call the roll. Trustee Kagan. Present. Trustee Abbott. Present. Trustee Banks. Present. Trustee Beavers. Present. Trustee Cunningham. Present. Mayor Murphy. Present. Quorum is established. Please stand for a moment of silence and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, led this evening by the Cub Scouts from PAC 104. presence tonight and uh, we're very pleased that you're able to be here along with your assistant uh, den leader Mr. Atwood and uh, uh, Mr. Mason was unable to be here tonight because of another uh, thing that came up but uh, thank you to all of the adult leaders who helped provide such important uh, activities for the youth of our community and, and to the scouts themselves uh, we congratulate you for participating in the scouting program and I would also want to mention to my fellow board members that they were kind enough to give me a, a booklet. And in the booklet, and they're working on uh, citizen activity, they commented about why we like Woodridge, ways to improve Woodridge, Illinois, and information on a good citizen. And, and as the village board knows, we're going to be setting some goals at a goal meeting coming up pretty soon. And uh, there are a number of good suggestions, so we'll make sure everybody else on the village board knows what those goals are. And, and one of them had a goal that he's already been able to convey to Mr. Mays tonight, and it's a goal that I would also like. And uh, I, why don't you share with everyone what you'd like to see in Woodridge? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to Taco Bell in Woodridge. Taco Bell in Woodridge, great. <laughs> 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 Our good police officers. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, great ideas, and we'll pass it on. And, uh, Continuing scouting is valuable for you. Thanks, friends, and congratulations. Thank you. We have a special anniversary, uh, service anniversary this evening, and for the purposes of doing so, I would like to invite uh, Chief Heron to the podium and uh, Patrol Officer Daniel Murray. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Gordon, I'd like to introduce you to Dan Murray. Uh, it's not the first time that you've seen him. Maybe for some it's the first time. Uh, but Dan, is in two days, will celebrate his 10th anniversary with the Village of Woodridge. Not all as a police officer, which is what he is today. But for the first six years, Dan was a CSO. When I was going through Dan's uh, bio file today, I thought back on the last 10 years. Um, Dan has worked very hard to get where he's at today. And, uh, that says a lot for Dan and, and his character. He really, uh, he really has done a lot. He's gone through a lot. Uh, so I'm very happy to uh, be doing his bio tonight for you. Uh, again, uh, Dan has uh, not only wears a blue uniform, but he has some specialties at the side. Uh, some of those are he's an evidence technician. He's one of those guys that does for fingerprints, comes back all loaded full of stuff and likes it. Uh, he's a child safety seat technician. He was a safety seat technician since he was a CSO and still is. And you'd say, well, what's the big deal with that, right? Um, as Dan will explain, or anybody that's a child safety seat, uh, certified child safety seats, it's probably one of the toughest trainings that you go through. Uh, it's very difficult to correctly put a child safety seat inside of a car. Uh, they're making it easier with engineering, but it's a difficult task to do. He's also one of our ATV, all-terrain vehicle officers. He's certified in that. He's a breathalyzer as well. And he's also working closely in the past, he's worked very closely with our Public Works Department in fleet maintenance, which will be mentioned here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, Dan, in his short 10 years, has received several letters of appreciation or honorable mention, three commendations, and one life-saving award. Uh, the life-saving award was actually where Dan and uh, Sergeant Richards actually, who's also here, uh, found one of our own crossing guards that went down and performed CPR. Uh, unfortunately, it was unsuccessful. 
Dan has also been acknowledged or received recognition for three years, for 2009, 10, and 11, from the Alliance of Intoxicated Motorists for his outstanding DUI enforcement. He was also in 2005 nominated for Employee of the Quarter with the Village, and in 2005 was named a civilian police, or police civilian uh, of a police department. When I talked to Dan's supervisors, uh, and some of these are mine too, Dan, so I have to. Uh, Dan's described as someone who's a very hard worker, someone who's trusty, trustworthy, dependable, enthusiastic towards his job, a solid performer, a professional. Why that one slipped by me? Uh, <laughs> considerate, but he always goes out of his way to help somebody. Um, Dan's one of those guys, as, as everybody that's here tonight, when you call the police and somebody comes to your house, you're glad that they come, and Dan's one of those guys. Uh, Dan, I don't believe yet, has finished your associate's degree. No, I didn't. You did? Yeah. So he's finished his associate's degree, mm -hmm. and hopefully will begin his, uh, his venture towards his bachelor's degree, and maybe on from there. We'll see. Baron Boyer, there's a little bit about Dan. Well, Officer Murray, on behalf of my fellow elected officials and, and the citizens, I wouldn't we want to congratulate you on your 10 years of service. You're part of what makes the Woodridge Police Department the excellent department that it is. And you know, the name Murray and Murphy are not that, are not that different. So I can relate a recent personal uh, situation where I had a phone message left for me at the Village Hall. And uh, the phone message was from a lady who said, as I recall, that she had, had witnessed uh, a fight and, and wanted to talk further with me about what she had observed. And, and that message didn't catch up with me. I think it came in on a Friday. It didn't catch up with me until the Monday. So I called her on that Monday and told her that this is Bill Murphy from the Village of Woodridge calling. She said, oh, she said, Murray and Murphy are, are so similar. I really meant to talk to Officer Murray. And I've done that, and he was just excellent. He was outstanding. He listened to me, and he helped me. So there's a first hand, one of those 20, 30,000 Woodridge residents that reflects on all of our employees and in this instance on you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. But evidently, payroll never confuses Murray and Murphy. <laughs> I'm also uh, remiss that we have another scout with us here this evening that I didn't have an opportunity to meet beforehand, but I believe uh, Jonathan Jeske is with us. Jonathan, could you please stand? Uh, welcome to the village board meeting room and uh, board meeting. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you go to school, and uh, what uh, troop you're in. Um, I'm a seventh grader at Jefferson Junior High, and I'm in Troop 516. Outstanding. Very good. And you're working on which badge tonight? Communications, outstanding. Many members of uh, the board were in scouting, Girl Scouting, Cub Scouting, Boy Scouting. Trustee Kagan is a, is a Eagle Scout. Once you're an Eagle Scout, you're always an Eagle Scout. So congratulations to you and uh, continue in scouting. It's worthwhile. Welcome. <laughs> we then turn to uh, public hearings, and this evening we have a uh, a formal public hearing which we will commence and call to order. This is a public hearing that the Mayor and the Board of Trustees of the Village of Woodridge convened for the purpose of entering into a boundary line agreement with the City of Darien. Notice of the public hearing on the matters to be considered was published in the Bugle on September 14, 2011. A copy of this notice shall be made a part of this hearing record as Village Exhibit A. Let the record reflect that all other notices required by statute of ordinance to be given have been given. At this time, I would ask the Village Board to consider rules of procedure for this evening's public hearing. A copy of such rules has previously been provided to each of you. For those of you in the audience, copies of the rules are available on the table to the right of the dais. I would now entertain a motion to adopt the rules as proposed by Trustee by motion by Trustee Kagan, second by Trustee Pizik. Questions or discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by the sign aye. Opposed, hearing none, the motion is approved. We will now uh, ask staff to proceed with uh, a summary of the proposed agreement. 
I'll just go ahead and uh, provide a quick overview. The proposed ordinance approves the new boundary line agreement with the city of Darien. The existing agreement expires in 2012, and the proposed agreement maintains the existing boundary line and will be in effect until 2031. There is some language providing the village of Woodridge's consent to serve the property at 8635 Lamont Road, uh, which is on the Darien side of the boundary if it should be requested. Thank you. Then we would now hear a statements or testimony from persons who wish to support the proposed agreement. And if there's anyone that would like to do so, please proceed to the podium. If not, we will now permit cross-examination of the staff. Uh, does anyone wish to cross-examine the staff who testified in support? If not, we will now hear statements or testimony or evidence from those that propose Oppose the proposed development agreement. At this time, I would then ask the village board for a motion to close the public hearing by Trustee Beaver, second by Trustee Abbott. All in favor indicate by the sign aye. Aye. Motion is approved. We then turn to questions from the public. Uh, first, an opportunity for residents and guests to uh, make comments or raise questions that are not related to the agenda. And that'll be followed with an opportunity to uh, raise questions and comments related to any of the agenda items. So if there's anyone with us tonight that would like to address the board on things that are not on the agenda, we would welcome you to the podium. Observing no one then, it's now an opportunity for residents and guests to ask questions or make comments on matters that are related to the agenda. And again, uh, please step forward and state your name and address for purposes of the record. Observing no one, we thank you for being with us tonight and the Lord's board continues with the consideration of the omnibus vote and the chair would entertain a motion this evening to approve omnibus vote items A through H and acceptance of I through L. Motion by Trustee Banks, second by Trustee Pizza to uh, approve omnibus vote items A through H and acceptance of I through L. Prior to uh, a review of those matters by Administrator Rush, is there anyone that would like separate consideration of any of those matters? If not, to Administrator Rush, please proceed with an overview of those matters. Certainly. Item A is ordinance number 201148. Um, again, that's authorizing the execution of the intergovernmental jurisdictional boundary line agreement between the city of Darien and the village of Woodridge. Um, that was the matter that we just had the public hearing on. Item B is acceptance of the audited 2010-11 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for the Village and the Library along with the TIF District Number 2. Lauterbach and Amon, our auditors contracted through fiscal year 2012, performed the annual audit and gave the opinion that the basic financial statements are fairly presented and are in conformity with generally accepted accounting principles. The Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for the Village and the Library along with TIF District 2 is being presented to the Board for its acceptance. Item C is acceptance of the 2010-11 financial report and audit for Seven Bridges Golf Club. Again, in conjunction with the village audit, the annual financial report for Seven Bridges Golf Club is being presented to the board for its acceptance. Item D, ordinance number 2011-49, amends the village code of the village of Woodridge, Title Seven, Section 7-5B-13K2, violations. The village code currently provides that water service to a premise that has a defective or failing cross-connection control device must address those issues and pay any required fees before service is reinstated. The proposed revision to the code adds a reference which specifically incorporates the existing fees that are already in place for water turn-ons for the non-payment. Item E, ordinance number 2011-50, grants a special use permit for a kennel Dogtastic Fun LLC at 8102 Lamont Road, Suite 1400. Dogtastic Fun LLC is requesting a special use permit to operate a kennel at 8102 Lamont Road, Suite 1400. The kennel will be operated as a doggy daycare and all activities related to the use will occur indoors. Item F is Ordinance 2011-51, authorizing the disposal of personal property owned by the Village of Woodridge. The Police Department has seized vehicles that were associated with criminal activities. The Village Board must authorize the disposal of those vehicles before the Department can sell them via auction. 
Proceeds are used to support public safety efforts. Item G, Resolution R68, 2011, ratifying an agreement with Warhees Associates, LLC, the Chief of Police Recruitment. Chief Steve Heron has announced his retirement, effective November 11, 2011. Voorhees and Associates will conduct the search effort for his replacement. The contract for services is $16,400, plus advertising and travel expenses for the candidates. Item H is a motion um, to waive the liquor license fee for St. Scholastica Daybreak Fundraiser on October 22nd. Um, as a nonprofit organization, St. Scholastic has requested the temporary liquor license fee be waived for their daybreak fundraiser. Um, item I, J, and K are related to minutes, and L is accounts payable. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rush. Uh, and there's been a motion made and second to uh, proceed with this item at this vote. Are there any final questions or discussion? Hearing none, Clark Nystrom, please call the roll. Trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Banks? Aye. Trustee Beavers? Aye. Trustee Cunningham? Aye. Trustee Kagan? Aye. Motion is approved. Uh, we have no communication or correspondence uh, this evening. Under my report, I would briefly uh, comment uh, the various audits that we uh, approved tonight to a very perfunctory, but it only comes as a result of a lot of hard work uh, on the part of all of our staff members, particularly in the finance department. So congratulations to diligence and expertise. We appreciate it. And if board members have any follow-up questions, uh, please contact the staff. Uh, the village administrator's report, Ms. Rush. Thank you. This evening I have two items for your consideration. First item is resolution number R69-2011. Approves an agreement for banking services with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank N.A. Um, the staff completed the request for proposal process in August of 2011 for banking services to ensure that we are receiving the best services for the fees paid. After reviewing the four banking proposals and analyzing the data submitted, staff recommends continuing services with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Uh, Chase is reducing, as part of this process, the current cost of services by $12,000. In addition to going forward with lower costs, Chase will make the new price effective January 1st, resulting in a year-to-date retroactive adjustment for nearly $9,000. Linda Dalton put uh, a lot of time and effort into this, as did Deb Freischlag. Um, do you have any further comments? They're both available for questions. Okay, uh, thank you. Having heard the recommendation, the Chair will entertain a motion to approve Resolution 69-2011, approving the agreement for banking service with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Motion by Trustee Beavers, second by Trustee Abbott to approve resolution 69-2011. Final questions or discussion? Hearing none, Clark Nystrom, please call the roll. Trustee Banks? Aye. Trustee Beavers? Aye. Trustee Cunningham? Aye. Trustee Kagan? Aye. Trustee Abbott? Aye. Motion's approved. Again, thanks to Linda and Deb. Um, this was a very significant effort. It hasn't been undertaken in quite a long time. And, uh, the end result is going to improve the operations at the front desk and in finance, and it results in cost savings. Thanks again. Item B is resolution uh, number R70, 2011, waiving the competitive bidding process and authorizing the village administrator to enter into a contract with Dell Marketing LP for the purchase of certain computer equipment and service to support the village email system. This purchase will provide for the implementation of additional storage area network uh, which will expand the existing virtual system. This is needed in order to upgrade the Exchange version 2010, which supports the Village Outlook software. The virtual system must be expanded now in order to move forward with that project, and the server expansion will be utilized for more data storage in support of our future da disaster recovery plan. This item was added to the agenda um, earlier this week. Um, there's a, a good deal of background and information in the agenda history. If there's any questions, uh, Sam Banda is here and Kevin Pallet. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rush. Uh, the chair would entertain a motion to approve resolution 70 2011. Seven. Motion by Trustee Kagan, second by Trustee Pizik to approve resolution 70 2011. Okay, final questions and discussion? Mr. Mayor? Trustee Kagan? Uh, this question, I guess, is for Sam. Um, previously, we had heard discussion about the uh, existing village uh, public drive. 
Uh, is this basically going to give us the additional storage space and you can figure that to deal with you know, everything you have on the, on the public drives and various users as well as your Exchange server? Uh, the answer is yes. It'll give us uh, increased capacity for not only the Exchange uh, upgrade, but it'll also give us more space for our data storage. Okay. That's been the transition. We, we've heard previous discussion from staff where, where you were talked about the limitations with the existing user public drive and how everything's sort of just floating out there in it one is. of the long drive. It is. So this will give us uh, above and beyond that, 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 that capacity to, to solve that, that problem. Perfect. Thank you. Additional questions or comments from board members? Hearing none, Clerk Eastern, please call the roll. Trustee Kagan? Aye. Trustee Abbott? Aye. Trustee Banks? Aye. Trustee Beavers? Aye. Trustee Cunningham? Aye. Motion approved. We have no active agenda. Is there any unfinished or new business to come before the board this evening? If not, it is necessary to, uh, when we adjourn this meeting, we'll be convening a board workshop. Immediately following that workshop, uh, we will convene an executive session for the purposes of discussing personnel. So the chair entertains a motion to adjourn to a workshop immediately followed by an executive session regarding personnel. Motion by Trustee Beavers, second by Trustee Pizek. All in favor indicate by the sign aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion is approved. We are now uh, convened into a workshop on uh, two matters on the active agenda this evening. Uh, Administrator Rush. Thank you. I'm going to go down to the podium. You hit it on me. Uh, good evening. Tonight, uh, the Village Board has the opportunity to consider whether or not to pursue electric aggregation for residents and small commercial users. Uh, the potential savings uh, from communities that have proceeded in this effort um, has ranged from $175 a year to $235 a year, most recently, um, that uh, Grays Lake and Libertyville have secured. Some communities, recognizing that the supply rate that is being charged by ComEd um, is going to be decreasing in 2013, have decided that this effort is not worth pursuing. Uh, so tonight I want to provide some background and get some feedback from the board as to whether or not we should um, continue to proceed in the aggregation process. Um, uh, this is the act, the Illinois Power Agency Act. It was passed about a uh, summer and a half ago. Uh, and it is the authorizing um, statute that allows us to proceed in this area. Uh, some communities have uh, proceeded, I think the earliest community was Fulton, Illinois. Um, that small community went through this process and started in April of last year with the referendum. There's two choices the village um, has available for us. We can um, do an opt-in or an opt-out. Um, as it notes on the slide, um, an opt-in is self-determination. There's really no village involvement. It is something that is available today, and residents could take advantage of that, and some residents have taken advantage of that. The opt-out program results in an automatic enrollment for residents and small com commercial users, and the village would then determine who is the electric supplier for the community. The distribution system would still be maintained by ComEd, and the billing is still completed by ComEd. The various aggregation steps, um, as you note, there's, there's quite a few. Obviously, we would have to um, take the better part of seven to nine months involved in this process. A lot of that time is really um, the education process that's involved for the community. The first step, though, is to proceed um, and decide whether or not we want to pursue the opt-out program. Uh, we would place an agenda item on the November 10th uh, agenda and consider the referendum question. The re actual referendum would occur in March. Uh, the, the referendum question is dictated by statute, and it is approved by simple majority. The ordinance establishes the electric aggregation program in the municipal code. Uh, it's a very generic type of ordinance. There's no, not a lot of detail involved in it. 
but it is required by state statute. The plan of operation and governance is where all of the details um, become uh, explained uh, both to the residents who would be participating and they would be our guiding um, regulations in terms of how we would proceed in this matter. This is where you would have policy discussions and the options would be outlined as to um, how, whether or not, um, for example, you would have um, a early termination fee or whether or not you would have um, green energy required. Again, the uh, POG FAQs, which is the plan of governance, um, is the bid parameters, the agreement and terms, uh, the fees and charges, how billing is handled, um, who is eligible and who is excluded, um, how moves are handled, people moving in and out of the community, who is the participants, how the liability is handled, and the roles of ComEd and the supplier. By statute, two public hearings are required. Um, the notice has to be published at least once a week for two consecutive weeks. And there is an opportunity for the community uh, to review and comment on the plan of governance and incorporate any changes. At that point, following the public hearings, the plan of governance would be adopted either by ordinance or resolution, and we would authorize the bidding process. The RFP versus bid. Um, this is something that uh, different legal counsel have different um, perspectives on it. Um, the suppliers uh, prefer an RFP um, to propose the program parameters. The rates are both are based on the program parameters themselves and it's much more subjective. Um, there is evaluation criteria but it is much more uh, flexible. Bids, um, on the other hand, would be where the municipality would define the program parameters uh, and the rates would be based on the defined program parameters. It's more objective, and the single evaluation criteria is rates. Through this process, obviously the staff um, here is not something that's something we're expert on. Um, and in many cases, um, and you could probably see, you can see the file folder on my desk, um, the village has been approached by probably nine or 10 different supplier consultants already uh, wishing to assist us through this process. Um, they, many of these folks have had experience in Ohio where um, electric aggregation has been in practice for over 10 years. Uh, and they, there's pros and cons to this. So we would um, most likely uh, want to employ a broker or consultant to help us through the process, uh, but we would want to choose that um, firm through an RFP. Uh, one of the things that uh, we also want to note on this is typically the broker and consultant um, is not paid directly by the municipality. Um, it is actually paid by the supplier. Um, you can break that relationship um, and that might be something that's advantageous but it's something we don't have to decide tonight. Uh, one of the things also just in terms of the cost, um, Typically, the cost uh, of the broker consultant services is about um, 0 0.005 cents per kilowatt hour, and that's built into the rate. Uh, and in the case of Grace Lake and Libertyville um, and in Oak Brook, the three communities were working together, and by not in, uh, employing a broker consultant, they saved about $150,000. But their staff was uh, very, very busy. Um, civic contribution, the act also provides that uh, as a part of the uh, rate, the community can build in a one-time or an annual payment based on the account enrollment or power usage, and that would be included in the price charged back to the uh, resident. Some communities are considering uh, this to support their sustainability efforts. For example, um, they might want to um, retool um, their public facilities so that they have more energy efficiencies in place. And so they actually create this um, component of the rate. And then they collect 
the dollars and then are able to reinvest them back into more sustainability type actions within the community. Or perhaps you want to have an increased presence in recycling or some other type of sustainability action. Um, this is one way to support those. Um, other communities are using this as a one-time grant to offset their expenses for going through the process. And some are considering adding this to generate funds for their operations. And others are shunning this as they don't want to increase their cost to the residents at all. Again, not something you have to decide tonight, but it is something that is a part of this process. As a part of the bid process, if we decide to proceed, we would identify the options that impact the cost of supply. It's a technical process, but you do want to be specific and upfront to avoid problems in the implementation. So as we would proceed in the process, we would identify in a, in a bid document um, options for the various suppliers to um, include pricing on. That would be a one year, a two year, a three year. Um, you might indicate whether there's an early termination fee. Um, if new enrollments come in, um, if they're going to be at the same rates and terms. Um, and of course that the building is continued to be done by ComEd. One of the options that we have available to us is whether or not we partner with other towns. Uh, partnering can get us better prices, um, can allow for sharing of staff resources. Uh, the most recent um, and most successful case of this, um, you probably saw it in the papers, was the village of uh, Oak Brook partnered with Grays Lake and Lincolnwood um, and combined their loads to 310 megawatts. Um, and that was through the benefit because they had the same village attorney and their village attorney um, used their uh, retainer fee, under the retainer fee, he provided the assistance to all three of these municipalities. And so there was no direct out-of-pocket cost. Will County is also offering to partner. Um, they are establishing through an intergovernmental agreement uh, the opportunity for municipalities, including Woodridge, to participate in um, an aggregation. And uh, they would um, uh, be only offering a one-year bid. Um, and they are working it so that um, a part of, the cons of that one-time consulting grant, the grant that we just spoke about, is actually remitted back to the Will County Governmental League to cover their costs, as well as to cover the costs of the broker. One of the uh, important factors, though, in terms of um, opting into the Will County proposal, while it's very staff effective in terms of our resources, um, it does, Will County is not going to be offering any type of green option or green energy requirement. Um, if that is something that is um, of interest, we can proceed with the Will County. It locks us in for a year, and then we can go about going on our own. So it is something we can do. Downers Grove and other communities have expressed an interest in partnering, um, so we do have the opportunity to do that. And that might give us more opportunity to be flexible um, versus the... Uh, the green options. Implementation. Um, some of the implementation issues that, that have been expressed by some of the communities that have proceeded through this process before us um, is just in terms of publicizing the bid results and time frame. Um, some of the residents have been confused about that. We, have, well, we will have to be very clear about when this all takes place, how it takes place, when the, the savings become effective. Um, again, another item is reviewing the customer list for ComEd. Um, um, as we know through the audit process that we've dealt with ComEd, sometimes their data is not clean. And uh, we would have to make sure that in terms of addressing um, that we're actually getting Woodridge residents and not Bolingbrook residents or Downers Grove, et cetera. Um, there is also the opt-out notice. Um, it includes you know, the timing and the process for the opt-out and then the role of ComEd. And that um, uh, can be a, sticky, a little bit of a sticky issue. You just have to make sure that the, the communication is clear. So in terms of policy decisions, the question is, um, do you wish to pursue electric aggregation through an opt-out program? 
which will require a referendum, and then you would see the referendum question in the form of an ordinance at our next meeting? Or do you wish to limit flexibility and limit staff time in a program? And if yes, then we would pursue the Will County Governmental League. Um, or if you wish to have some flexibility, then we would pursue um, trying to pair up with another municipality um, to see if we can find someone who has municipal uh, mutual interest. So those are the items before you in terms of feedback. Okay, thank you for that presentation. We will now turn to the questions and we'll certainly focus on on the policy decisions, but certainly any other aspect of the report. And, and let me perhaps ask uh, a beginning question or two. Uh, without going to the uh, important question of whether or not we want to pursue uh, aggregation through an opt-out program through a referendum, uh, if we should choose to go in that direction, as I understand it, there are at, least at this point two options, the Will County program, and uh, second program, uh, partnering with, with some other communities. Or going on our own. Or going on our own. Uh, on balance, should we decide to go forward, what does the staff think is in our best interest uh, at this particular point in time? Well, in terms of conserving staff resources, the Will County effort is absolutely the, um, the best option available for us. Um, However, if there is any interest in offering some flexibility in terms of uh, green energy or moving forward with sustainability type actions, then um, I suspect it wouldn't be very difficult to do it, prepare an RFP. We have lots of models and uh, we do have the ability to, and, and interest by other municipalities to partner. And that would take more staff time? Slightly more staff time, yes more staff time and we'll come and approach, but if we were partnering with some other communities. Right. We could share the, and again, because we're partnering, um, the efforts I probably would be trimmed in terms of the effort. And again, because Oak Brook and Grays Lake and Libertyville have just gone through this, they are making available all of their documentation. So it wouldn't be, you know, extremely difficult to do. And perhaps for uh, for board members uh, and myself and residents and guests that are here tonight or maybe viewing this, tell us a little bit more about what the advantages of the sustainability and green efforts would bring about. Really, they, um, the folks that we've talked to, including the Illinois Power Agency, um, if we're going to do this just for a cost control effort, um, it doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense because in 2013, the ComEd rates will be coming back down towards the, um, the market, but the improved prices that people are getting through this bidding process. Um, so essentially what we would be foregoing is a year or two years of prices that would be advantageous to the residents. If we pursue a partnership with other communities, not the Will County approach, can we limit that to a year or two? Yes. Okay. Other questions from board members or comments? Mayor Murphy. Trustee Beavers. Um, Katie, you mentioned if we went with Will County that um, there was a certain um, cost factor that we wouldn't be able to get back. Could you explain that again? Uh, if we go th through Will County Governmental League, what they're going to do is they're going to build in their cost of assisting the municipalities in this effort into the rate structure um, and as well as the cost of their consultant to assist in the process. Okay, but then you said if we did it the other way that it's something that we could use for the village? Um, correct. We could actually then um, create a grant um, for the community, for, for Woodridge, and build that into our bid and our RFP and actually um, generate dollars that would actually be used to the benefit of our community, um, whereas Will County will not have that opportunity. Thank you. Mayor Murphy. Trustee Abbott. Uh, Katie, I had a couple of questions. Um, so the benefits of this would only be about a two year, for, for a two year period? Right, um, at least right now. Um, the way that the uh, Illinois Power Authority um, 
works, they actually bid the power supply for the state of Illinois for Comet, and Comet was the winner of that. That contract ends in 2013, and it's anticipated that when they go back out to bid, that their the, the successful process will reduce the price of the supply close to what we have um, been seeing in these other bid awards. And the bid, uh, the benefits that we would get in a one or two year period then for homeowners, what were the numbers you said it looked like savings um, per the, year? The initial um, average was about $175 per household on an annual basis. Okay. Um, and in, um, I think the most recent Oak Brook, Libertyville, Grays Lake effort, um, it was like $235 per household. Um, and that's for residents. Um, this also would cover small businesses um, under 100 kilowatt hours, and they would be lumped into the program as well, um, automatically. And so, for example, a 7-Eleven would be about the size of 100 kilowatt hours, um, and they would save more than that, um, probably, you know, five to $600 a year. Um, as far as the costs, you mentioned that, um, the cost for the consultants is built into the pricing. Now, no, there's no out-of-pocket. Okay, so there's no out-of-pocket at all? No. And the $175 per year up to $235 per year, that's factoring in the the, uh, the broker's yes, it commission is. fee? Okay. Um, what of how many towns, do you know how many towns have done this? I mean, how long has this been available, I guess, is my first uh, question. This has really been available. I mean, the first set of communities actually started this in the April election um, with a referendum. And uh, so I'd say I think Fulton probably started um, accruing benefits and savings to their residents early summer this year. Um, and there are, the, for example, Oak Brook and is the most recent and most close example. They passed their referendum and they are moving forward. They should be in place January 1st to start recouping savings for their residents. For the towns that have done this, have they any negatives that they didn't see coming? I would say that the negatives have been mostly um, on the implementation side just in terms of some resident confusion. Um, there, it, that's why you do provide the opt-out. So if someone, you know, you provide them the price that they can, you'll have the bid prices when you send out that letter. And you can say, you can choose to stay with ComEd and, as the current supplier and pay seven cents per kilowatt hour. Or you can, um, you know, otherwise you will be included in the program at five cents plus some change on per kilowatt hour. Um, if they choose to opt out, they just have to, to submit some notification and ComEd will opt them out and they will proceed. What's happened is that there's been a couple people who were surprised to receive the letter just because they hadn't seen the other mailings. And so uh, we're learning from some of these other communities really how the implementation pieces go forward. There hasn't been any other downside otherwise. Hey, have we that education component and notification is there it seems like there should be some cost associated with that. it's all right. that's where the if you are with um, the broker or the consultant they take that price off okay all the letters and notifications okay. so if if we were moving forward with this is is it done for a defined period of time like yes. one year two years when three you bid years? you actually can bid it for one years two years three years and then when you accept the bid you would accept it for the one year two year or three year period so you would have the opportunity to lock in a price for two years. In a situation where at the end of the two years, let's say we lock in a two year price, at the end of the two years, then what? Then we um, can choose to do it again, or we can stop. Okay. So we would, you know, um, very similar to what we do with our streetlight program right now, we are aggregating our streetlight expenses today um, as a municipality with other municipalities. And periodically, those contracts are up, up for renewal. And the broker that we have engaged with 
We'll go out and bid those. He will advise us what the price is, and then we will lock in that price. And typically, it's much lower than what is being charged to, on the market. So, so it's something that it would be an ongoing process. Like I said, there's communities in, the, in, uh, in Ohio that have been doing this for 10 years and have been um, playing the margin. So they get, they get a bit of savings to their residents lower than what the uh, power authority is able to purchase. So at the end of two years, let's say ComEd's rates look like they're going to be lower, we could go back to that? Absolutely. And would that take another referendum to go back to it? No. Or is it sort of like the one you do expires? Um, you still have the authority, you just wouldn't be, you wouldn't go back out onto the market. Okay. So the referendum gives the authority, mm -hmm. and that's for a certain period of time, I assume. Right. So you, you have the capability to do it. You know, I'm not sure if it's blanket forever or if it's for an extended period of time. It might be something that Tom can look at. Okay, so you wouldn't have to go through the referendum process yeah. more than once. Mm -mm. No. Um, I don't think I have any other questions. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? If we were to uh, not partner with uh, the Will County communities and partner with other communities, so we might be able to get on the path of sustainability, et cetera. Uh, are there communities in the area that we know might be interested in talking with us about it? Um, yeah, actually this morning after our um, meeting, um, Downers Grove indicated that they would be willing to proceed with us, um, or at least explore that opportunity. And I suspect Burr Ridge would too. And maybe Willowbrook, but really. And going forward with uh, two or four or more communities would lessen the staff time? Yes. But, but not as much as if you want to Will County. Right. Will County, because it's going to be a very simplified and uh, limited bid process, it's really going to be straightforward. They're going to just handle it. And that's for one year? One year. Okay, other questions from board members? Well, I think there's two, uh, and we can continue with questions, but, but there are two uh, policy decisions at least to make. First of which is do we want to pursue aggregation through an opt-out program which requires the referendum? And uh, if so, uh, do we want to look at Will County or do we want to look at partnering with other communities? So let us look at that first question where we want to pursue the aggregation uh, program. And, um, let's just go uh, one by one and inquire a board member beginning with Trustee Kagan. Uh, Trustee uh, Pizza? I concur with that. Trustee Beavers? Yes, I would um, like to pursue the aggregation. Trustee Banks? I concur. Trustee Abbott? Uh, I do not concur. I do not I would not be in favor of moving forward. Mr. Mayor, because it just seems like the savings we're looking at over a two-year period, when you balance that against the confusion that I think a lot of people are going to have and the uncertainty, uh, it just doesn't seem like it's worth it to me, but that's my opinion. Thank you. Uh, and the mayor favors pursuing the uh, aggregation program, so that would bring us to uh, the question of uh, do we want to pursue the Will County governmental league option or to partner with other communities. And so let's first uh, give board members an opportunity to ask any questions about those options uh, before we seek uh, individual views on those two options. Any, any questions on the Will County versus partnering with other communities? Mayor Murphy. Trustee uh, Katie, then if we go with the Will County, then it sounds like that's kind of like kind of a kind of a done deal. You just kind of sign in, sign on to it. You, they you don't would have like as much to, input. Um, yes, they would like a letter of intent. Um, we would sign an intergovernmental agreement, um, ind indicating you know kind of the parameters, of what kind of services we would be getting from them, um, and how their program would work. And uh, they would then pretty much prepare the education pieces and. Uh, help walk us through the process. It's pretty straightforward. But if we go try to partner with other communities, then we have to kind of sit down and come to an agreement on what it's going to be? We would, um, I think the first step is to um, decide upon um, an RFP um, to, to interview some consultants and decide how we're going to, which consultant would be the best consultant for the group to proceed with. 
um, once the consultant is selected, then we really need to turn our attention to the plan of governance. Um, and that would, um, we'd set up a series of policy issues for the different boards to pick. Um, some of those you wouldn't actually need to make firm hard decisions on until we actually had um, additional conversation probably into January, February. Are there any issues that you can identify now that could be sticking points where one municipality may want, you know, X go the direction, one direction where a different municipality might want to might not agree with that? Um, yes, um, but I think in the bid document you might be able to actually have the ability to break those out. So just like you would in the street contract, you could have different options. And then at the time that the vendors bid, then you could pick and choose which um, option you would actually select. So at that time, the municipality might say, you know what, because Downers Grove did it this way, they got a better price, and it's still recouping some type of sustainability benefit. Um, so we could actually accept their price. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional questions on the two options? Anyone? Trustee Pizza? Yes, I have a question for me. Um, on the Will County, what is the green energy there is none. There is none. No, it's strictly a cost basis. Okay. Other question? How difficult would it be, or what would the situation be if we went with the Will County one year program at the conclusion of that to, first of all, determine that it was successful and the residents are saving money? Uh, but at the end of that one year, uh, we wanted to uh, pursue the sustainability uh, efforts that are out there. Uh, having that going forward the first year, particularly partnering with some other communities, how difficult would uh, it be for us to go in that direction at that point in time? You know, I would have to look at the intergovernmental agreement with Will County and see how much it ties our hands going forward. Well, that may be. It's a one-year agreement, but it's a one year, it, their, their contract is going to be one year with the supplier, whether or not um, it ties our hands further in terms of our participation with Will County. Is, I haven't seen that yet. They, uh, they haven't gotten that far. Really, the time-sensitive piece to this is whether or not we proceed with, with the program and to get the referendum on the ballot. Um, that's really where they're everybody's pushing because there's a time frame that we have to get that going. Other questions or comments before we address the two options? Mayor Murphy. Trustee Abbott. Uh, Katie, uh, if we were to do what the mayor was just mentioning, the option of going with Will County for one year, will, will, will the, the cooperating with other municipalities, will that ship have left? No. For now? I mean, no, I don't believe so. Okay. I mean, is it, if, our, if we want to partner with others, I guess to ask a different way, is it now or never, or do you think we still have the opportunity to partner a year down the road? I, I'm, and I'm not 100% sure, but my understanding is that the ship doesn't leave, that you do have the ability to, to move things around. I just don't know how long you're tied into Will County. Okay, thank um, you. And I can, you know, we can, if you'd like, we can move in, we can proceed with Will County. Um, subject to a time limit if they, unless they have a uh, five-year commitment or something like that. Yeah, if we go in that direction, I certainly think we want that question mm -hmm. addressed. Other questions or comments? Mayor Murphy. Uh, Trustee Banks. Um, Katie, I don't know whether you could answer this or not, but if we decide to go with Will County, do we know if the other municipalities uh, would be interested in, in going with Will County as well? There has been several communities that have indicated that they are going to proceed with Will County, including Joliet, mm -hmm. um, Homer Glen, I know for sure. Uh, both what of them about Downers Grove? Um, um, Downers Grove has been approached by Will County and they are considering it. Yeah, they're having the same debates and discussions right now as mm -hmm. to whether or not um, and in particular, I think Downers Grove mentioned that they're you know, considering whether or not to have a grant program or a amount of the rate built in to sustain their efforts on sustainability. And they wouldn't be able to do that with the Will County program? No, they would not. And the larger the group, which at this point presumably would be Will County, the larger the group probably yields better rates? Not necessarily. 
Um, that's one of the things that, um, because we're so new into the game in terms of the whole state, um, the individual brokers and suppliers that I've spoken with um, have indicated that they're not really sure of that question. They couldn't really give me a solid answer. So whether or not Will County might be aggregating um, 300 or 400,000 services, that might be almost too big for the market. So it's a question, we're just not sure. Other questions or comments before we address which are the two directions we'd like to pursue? Okay, if not, uh, let us get some feedback on which of those two would be a preference. And uh, let me begin with uh, Trustee Abbott, and, and, and I know from the record that uh, you're not in favor of pursuing this, but what's your advice if we, if we go forward with one of those two? If we go forward, I would think the uh, Will County is probably the better option. It sounds like it's a little cleaner, a little easier. Um, so that would be the direction I would think. Um, I do think the, um, going in the direction of Will County um, because it will save us money. Uh, I am in favor of uh, the Will County government lead for when Trustee Beavers. Um, while um, I think Will County uh, may be an easier way to go, I'm more in favor of the flexibility that we would have in going with the other municipalities and we also the sustainability. So I'd be in favor of that. Thank you. Trustee Pinsley? I am also in agreement with Trustee Beavers. Um, as Will County probably would be easier, um, I would like to see some flexibility um, in passing what we could do with other municipalities, um, especially in the green energy section. Trustee Kagan? Um, I, I, I like the Will County approach because I think it's a, a much more shovel-ready deal, per se. Uh, we can obviously get in for a limited amount of time while we learn a little bit more about the process, as well as continue to work with other municipalities because, you know, they may not have their plan ready to go for you know, operation here while they may be looking for 13. It also may give us an opportunity to, again, just evaluate what is this program's true benefit and work. Well, we have two board members uh, that uh, favor partnering with other communities yet to be identified, and uh, three board members that, that prefer the Will County option. Obviously, Trustee Pittenger is not present tonight. I favor going forward, uh, and could be comfortable uh, with either, and, uh, and therefore, I think uh, because uh, those that are here, uh, the Will County option seems to be a preference by a slight, slight amount uh, that, that I would echo the comments made by those in favor of the World County approach. But the provision, we're going to check out just what's the restriction in terms of the future as we would go forward. I think everybody would come Okay. What else would you need to know from the board tonight in terms of direction? That's really all I need. Thank you. We then move to uh, pension. Ms. Rush. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity. I wanted to bring before you, we will be going over at the goal setting, the tax levy options. So I just wanted to discuss tonight, because it is a big piece, it's almost half of, or more than half of our tax levy. I wanted to discuss some of the changes and discuss the pension piece of the tax levy. There was pension reform 2011. Um, it was Public Act 96-1495, which took effect January 1st, 2011. This legislature affected the pension tax levy determination and how it will be, how we will go forward with it. One of the things that happened with that legislature was that there was the expanded investment authority for pension plans over 10 million. Woodridge is at 25.5 million, so this is, we are over that 10 million, so this is in our realm that we can invest in other items now. Uh, we can capture a higher investment return, hopefully, by investing in corporate bonds. 
Also, it's expanded the equity percentage. It's phased in over two years. 7-1-2011, it increased from 45% to 50%, and the pension board did go with that. They approved it. And then in January 1st, 2012, they can increase that percentage from 50% to 55% of the equity portion of their, the 55% of their portfolio. The actuarial method changes. In the legislature, to determine the minimum employer contribution, the actuarial method projected unit credit, or they call it PUC, um, can be used versus entry age normal, which has been used for years. And there was kind of a coincidence that that language is the same as the teacher's retirement in this area. So they, do, they are looking at that during this session in regards to whether that should stay as that language. The projected unit credit, what that happens with that is that there are smaller contributions early in the member's career and then larger as they approach retirement. The entry age normal evenly distributes that over the member's career. The PUC amortizes um, that change. If you change from the entry age normal to the PUC, you have to amortize that change over 10 years um, per generally accepted accounting principles. The amortization period, the unfunded accrued liability, previously it's been 100% funded by 2033, so there's 22 years left. That law was passed in 1993, and it gave 40 years total, so we're into it, and it would be 22 years as of now. However, the legislature now says that you can amortize it over 30 years until the year 2040. And then it's like, what happens after 2040? Um, that is a question that people have been asking because plans are gonna be around forever. Why do you fund to a specific point in time? Um, so there could be future legislation that would extend it again. Um, the total liability is not changing. It's kind of like if you amortize it over 30 years, it's like refinancing your mortgage. So you're just extending that liability. The state also changed the amortization target to 90%. Generally accepted accounting principles requires 100% unfunded liability amortized. So if a choice of what the tax levy requirement was based on the 90%, the auditors would have to incorporate footnotes and would say that we're not following generally accepted accounting principles. Some say that by amortizing it longer um, and changing methodology, methodologies that this is kicking the can down the road. Um, it's increasing the volatility in the future contribution requirements. The Woodridge Police Pension Fund, right now, uh, fiscal year 2011, the investment returns were 12.62%. The interest rate of return assumption that has been used in the past for at least over five years has been 7.75%. So we did exceed that 7.75 this last year and the year before, but 2008 was a different story for everybody. The actuarial results, uh, last year's village contributed little more than uh, 1.3 million and that it was slightly, or that was the requirement and we had more than that after the tax extension. Um, so we required 1.3 and we came in about almost 1.35. The actuarial results came in, 
after this last audit and the police pension board met at a special meeting on October 24, 2011 to go over those results. And at that meeting, they seem to be between two options. Option one reflects the pre-legislature before the Public Act of 96.1495, and those provisions that would be the 22-year amortization, the tax levy requirement would be 1.3 million, just slightly over that, and the percent funded would be 61.6%. With those current assumptions, this amount plus employee contributions covers pension payments to retirees. So investment returns would go straight to covering and reducing the liability. Option two reflects prior to the legislation, except for they would use the 30-year amortization, but then if they did that, they would also like to change the interest rate assumption from 7.75% to 7.25%. The tax levy required under that scenario would be $1,286,837. <coughs> I'm having Michael help me in passing out a chart to summarize all of these options. Percent funded at that point then would be 58.2%. There is another option um, that still stays within the generally accepted accounting principles. The village board could decide to keep the current assumptions prior to the legislature, except they could amortize over the 30 years um, and not change the interest rate of return. If that was the case, then the tax levy required would be $1,120,246. And each of those options, the last year's results plus the three options I spoke about are on the chart that is now hopefully in your hand. So. As far as which option to follow, um, for one, the police pension board is holding a special meeting on November 2nd, 2011 at 5 p.m to make the recommendation to the village board. They um, are under statute supposed to recommend something to the village board, so they will be doing that at that time. And then we will need to go over these options even further at the village goal setting so, set, um, meeting so that we can determine which way you want to go, and I'll have to have options available for you that shows each of those. Also, I wanted to go over one other item. So you guys can com contemplate the chart so that you'll be ready for goal setting, but I also wanted to go over an IMRF funding issue. IMRF had offered a rate phase in in 2010 and 2011. Otherwise, the increase in rate was gonna be over 10%. This was to give some relief to the municipalities. However, the auditors during our audit this year brought to our attention that this caused an additional liability. The communication had not been clear and we were under the impression that the difference would affect the future rates and they might stay higher, but it would just roll it in and smooth it out eventually. However, After talking to IMRF and talking to our auditors, they're saying that it would be best by having a cash contribution beyond the payment, um, beyond what is determined by our current rate. Otherwise, that additional amount that was phased in, the difference, that's gonna be amortized over 30 years rolling and the interest rate of seven point, it, it would be compounded at an interest rate of 7.5%, 
and that would be continuously rolled into the rate. So you'd have interest upon interest, and so in five years we could have a hundred thousand dollar liability and not knocked enough off of it. So what they have recommended is to pay that additional liability off so that compounded interest does not keep adding to it and increasing our liability. They mean the auditors? Yes. The auditors have recommended that and after talking to IMRF they were of that opinion too otherwise that liability will just keep building. The library liability currently is $12,953 and I believe at their last board meeting I saw in the minutes that they had brought that to the attention of their board. I did not see it approved but I I think it was approved. Um, and the village liability right now is $59,598. So I would recommend that we pay both of those to IMRF in November. And then after answering any questions, obviously we'll have further discussions at the November 3rd goal setting meeting and then on November 10th, 2011 is when we would <coughs> approve the determination of the tax levy and then going forward I think it's December 6th is when the actual tax levy is approved and the public hearings are. So I can entertain any questions at this time. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Questions from board members? you say your impression of the library is that they will go and, and pay the, their liability? Yes. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, there's no further matters under the active agenda for the workshop, so we will avoid it. We entertain a motion to adjourn the workshop and move to the executive session. Motion by Trustee Second by Trustee Kagan. All in favor indicate by the same aye. All the questions approved. We will immediately convene in the executive session in the conference meeting.